So, welcome to the next edition of the Rare Business Podcast. With me today, I have Frank Eliason. Hi, Frank. Hello, thank you for having me. Ah, you're very welcome. So, Frank, can you tell us a little bit, we want, I want to talk to you about your, the, the book that you've just recently published, but I also want to just go back a little bit and say, for the benefit of our, our listeners and also our readers, is tell us a bit about you and a bit about the work that, 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 that you do currently. Sure. So my name is Frank Eliasson. Uh, many people knew me online uh, from my uh, Comcast Cares days. Today I'm Senior Vice President of Social Media for Citibank or City um, US. And you know, you know, but my background, I always refer to people, tell people I'm a simple customer service guy. My background has always been in customer service. And it gives me a different perspective than a lot of people when it comes to social media. Uh, and I think it's garnered some of the success in the ways I look at things. Uh, you know, so, you know, I have the book. I'm now the author of At Your Service, which uh, people ask me what that's about. And I basically say it's a mix of customer service, marketing, PR. It really comes down to what is the culture of your company? What is, what are you about? Because in watching these things for years, I've seen these things really, you know, how they changed companies and I think there's a lot of power there and how they're you know also how social media is bringing people together in new ways so that's a little bit about me um, you know I do a lot of different things and I like to speak about uh, the service world and ways that we could certainly make it work better absolutely that's uh, that's fantastic I must say Frank there's a couple things I wanted to say was one I got your book and I read it and like I said just before the call is there's not many books that I read that I just think, blimey, that's brilliant. I really like it. It's very straightforward. It takes a very much a storytelling approach. And I must say that I am jealous because it's a book that I just think, I wish I'd written that. That's fantastic. Uh, you know, storytelling, you know, social media is a lot about storytelling. Telling the story of your own brand if you're in, in you know, marketing, unfortunately, is not from the company's perspective. It's more from the customer's perspective. And I found that storytelling is also the way to drive change in organizations. You know, many organizations are very metric based and I find uh, that people tend to look past a lot of the metrics, but when you share a story and you tell a story of the customer experience, it, it tends to drive a lot of change. And so, you know, that's the, the, why I chose to go that path. And I really wanted to, the book to be something that, uh, a beginning phone rep could read and get something out of, but I also wanted something that a CEO could read and say, wow, I didn't even think of that. I didn't even realize that this was going on in my company. And, you know, by doing so, hopefully, you know, reaching out to those individuals and then driving change within a lot of organizations. Absolutely. I mean, and I just, I, I do really love the fact that throughout the book, you have used these stories to highlight issues and facilitate change, change of mindset and stuff. And I think that's, it, it's less about sort of, you know, it seems to be less about data and metrics and process and because real change does come about from having people connect with almost emotional things. You know, you talked about a daily newsletter you used to do at Comcast using real tweets, call texts, tw pictures from Twitter, YouTube videos, etc. So, I mean, one of the biggest issues in the whole sort of customer engagement field right now that seems to be rising up the agenda is this, the idea around big data and how it's the answer, as it were, is becoming the panacea. But I think what I took from your book is that you're t turning around and saying, well, actually, it's not necessarily. Actually, finding those stories can be just as important, if not more important. Would, would you agree with that? Yeah, well, you know, people always talk about, and I've been hearing for years, with the ROI of social media. And every time I hear one of those talks about it, I'm not hearing people talk about how the ROI is, you know, driving changes in product, changes in uh, process in a company, and then measuring those things, which are real, there's real metrics there in terms of the, the actual ROI that you can obtain. And so, you know, I think there's, there's this balance there. At the same time, I'll take away from the fact that there is, the data is great. Uh, I think that I have a chapter in the book called Scalable Intimacy, and I, I have this view of social in two different spectrums. Spectrum number one is your own employees and how they are talking about your brand or how they're advocating for the brand or not. 
Uh, so that to me is one piece of that spectrum. But on the scalable intimacy side, there's also this other side to it, which is now I can actually get to know my customer for what they want the world to know. I can actually know them in a much different way. And it, you know, it then becomes, how do you use that information? You know, I, I work in the banking business and I take very firm beliefs that you should not be using that type of information to say underwrite a loan. I think if you were to do things like that, you'll scare people out of even using, doing things in social or sharing things in social. But you, know, you could use it in other ways. And I, I picture a day where calls are routed to people with similar interests to you because you know, if you think about it, the best customer experiences you've ever had were never the ones that were efficient. They were never the ones that got you on and off. You didn't really remember that. Sure. But when you went to that restaurant and you're with your kids and that waiter or waitress, you started playing with the kids and connected to them in, in a different way. You remember that experience. You know, so how do you build that in a scalable way? Well, imagine routing calls to people with similar interests to you. You can really have that you know, happen on a new scale level. I also imagine marketing material someday is not so much geared towards the company's vision of things, but it's geared towards what you would personally be interested in. So, you know, that's where I think there's a big difference. It's not so much the data in terms of, wow, now I can sell more, I can do more. It's this intimacy that is really missing in a lot of things we've done. I think in big business, we've gotten away from really knowing our customers. And this is one of the reasons why I think small businesses do so well because their they're CEOs and the founders, they're directly with those customers. They're connected to them. They know their interests. They know their likes. They know exactly what they want. Yeah. You've also been credited with being the sort of the, the founder or the father of social customer service or social service or customer service on, sh on social media, however you want to you know term it. I mean, do you think that... I mean, social media is driving a lot of a lot of change in in various organisations in various ways. But you also talked about that the, the idea that social customer service is a failure. There's a chapter in your book, I think, that you, you address it. And I, what I wanted to do is just explore that because that's actually quite a controversial thing to say. Even mm -hmm. though that, that there's many companies doing it, there's not many companies that are doing it very very well. So why would you say that we're a failure at it so far? <laughs> Well, you know, and it's interesting because, you know, we weren't, uh, Comcast wasn't the first company to do social servicing. You know, there was other companies like Dell that were also doing it. But one of the things that people didn't realize that was going on at Dell, they didn't realize that, that was going on at Comcast, is we were taking this information and we were striving to drive change with it. We were actually trying to improve upon these reasons why people were talking in social. When I hear... PR people speak, and happened the last time I was in uh, England. You know, I did a whole speech about social media customer service being a failure. And shortly after the speech, I, you know, was sitting there watching the other speakers. And one of the other, there's a panel that came up, and a pizza chain. Their head of PR was there, and she said, "I disagree with Frank. Our customers want social service." So as I'm sitting there, I went right onto their Facebook page. And the first thing I saw on their Facebook page, huge, huge writing, I've called three times and you still can't get it right. <laughs> that person didn't want social service. They wanted their, their, their call to be handled right the first time. You know, this is really what it's about. You know, it's this PR speak of you know, that people want this. It's not that they want it. They want service done right and they they want it actually handled so social media customer service you have to, I, I respect every company that tries to help their customers if i see a customer yelling on a street corner i want to help them you know social should be no different but that being said if you're not fixing the core issues that are a problem all you're doing is sending a message to all your customers if you want the right help you have to go on and blast our brand and social media to get that help I think that's that, that, that's really fair because I think one of the other things you say in the book, which I really like, is you actually turn around and say, "Well, look, building on your point, you say, look, you shouldn't be in social media if you if the, what you're currently doing, the core of what you're currently doing, doesn't actually 
that isn't performing at it, you know, at its best. Is what's the point of adding something else, you know, to the mix when you're not actually as as good as you can be in in, in the um, in your existing channels or your, whether you're existing products or services? What yeah, you know, I was going to say one of the companies I talk about a lot in the book is a company Amazon. Amazon, I love uh, Amazon, but Amazon has a very unique perspective when it comes to customer service. Their view, first of all, if you go to their website and you try and find services, it's not that easy. Mm -hmm. But that being said, when people do get to their service department, they they view it as their website failed. We did not give you the means to do what you needed to do on our website sure. we to fix that. But So they concentrate their service experience purely on the web. But it's really interesting because as, as you talk about people with Amazon, you know, Amazon's one of the most loved companies. You know, they love the experience they have. And that's because Amazon tends to be very consistent in how they deliver. They, they, here's what we promise, here's what we deliver, and we do it really well. That's where companies should really be focused on. What, do, you know, what can we deliver, and how do we deliver it? Can we do it the best we possibly can? And that, that's where the victories are in social media. You know, Amazon's a great example of it. I think another great example I talked about in the book is Apple. Yeah, Apple is one of the most discussed brands in social media, and overwhelmingly, usually positive. Mm -hmm. Yet their amount of social media presence that they're actually managing is minimal. You know, the last time I checked, I think I found two Facebook fan pages, and it was obvious that they were run by outside marketing firms, and they they really weren't putting an effort towards it. You know, but yet it's one of the most discussed brands in social media. Kind of goes against the grain of what a lot of people say. Oh, you must be in social media. No, you don't. Your customers are going to be there. What are they going to share? Sure. I mean, also what you're you're also um, saying in the book is you talked about social media and 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 also customer behavior and and how it's this is what I want to explore because we have a lot of very large companies that have, if you like, embedded processes and systems and ways of doing things with like big call centers with. IVR traditional call center approaches, but how much is the social media wave and the, the customer behavior looking for service on social media? Is, how much is that challenging traditional customer services, uh, customer service approaches? I mean, you talk about from one to one to one to many in the book as well. Yeah, well, it's it's completely changing all aspects of it. You know, and, and the great story that was on the web yesterday. I was reading about it, but it's happened over the the past week or so. Was Aetna, a U.S.-based health insurance company, and this gentleman was, um, he reached his limit and they weren't going to cover anymore, and he started very much discussing it very, at a high level on social media to the point where their CEO started engaging with it, and the next thing you know, they've now, for him, taken away that limit. Well, that's interesting, but, you know, that that's something now they set a precedent. They you know, in their response to the blasting of the brand, was that a good thing to do? Was that a bad thing to do? Should they have had it in the first place? What's that going to do down to others, you know, that don't get that privilege and then come across this story? So you have to figure these things out. You have to know what you're about, what you're not about, and live up to it. And in this case, it's going to create an environment where people are going to demand that their limits be removed, just as happened then to this other gentleman who had cancer. And so that challenges their process, what they had. You know, other aspects to that is, you know, most companies, think about when you call a company, if you try and escalate to get to maybe a decision maker, because that's the problem in a lot of these things, they have this set process, and the set process says, nope, you don't qualify for that. Nope, tough, have a nice day. Yet any reasonable person would say, oh, you should get that, or, you know, we should do this for you. Sure. But our process says no. Well, one of the things is we make it very difficult for company or for customers to actually escalate calls to get to someone who can make those decisions. Social now gives them a means to do that. Uh, these are all challenges. So you have to be consistent with what you want and your beliefs. But there's also this other power, which is, if you're a highly passionate brand, now I'm not going to be one to tell you every brand should be out there doing community, et cetera. You know, it does it varies based upon the type of company you are. Sure. But you know, one of the in my prior employer, Comcast, was they do internet, TV, et cetera. 
people are highly passionate on those topics. You know, and one of the areas that's interesting is when you think about internet and internet troubles. It could be the provider, could be your computer, could be Windows, could be Mac, could be your router, um, you know, and various brands of routers, or it could be the modem. All these things could be the issue. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what happens? You, you have an issue like that. You call the cable company, my internet's not working. Well, your internet's working fine. We see it. Everything's fine. Not us. So then you call the router company, and the router company says, you know, here's what we can do. You know, it's not us. You call Microsoft. You call the computer manufacturer. What is going on in all these things? How do you get this all together? The community where it's peer helping peer, if done right, can be extraordinarily powerful at finding these solutions and really create a way for people to actually find that solution. So it's making customers part of your solution base. But you have to do it in a way, you have to do it in a way where customers would want to do that. You know, I look at a lot of communities out there where it's not really a community, it's one person posting responses to the company. Eh, that's not a real community, that's an FAQ. Yeah. Uh, but if you can, if you have that type of passionate brand that people want to talk about you, you have to find ways to do that. At Comcast, I manage our communities and we have one community, we have 13.5 million visitors a month. As we surveyed users, 80% found their answer there the first time. Wow. If you cut out times how much a call costs, huge cost savings are possible in, you know, in that realm, but it takes a lot of other factors that you have to think about. Don't just jump because, oh, someone said you must do these things. You know, know your customers, know their willingness to do these things, and then certainly study the ones that have worked and build it right. But if you do it, you can now save a lot of money in how you go about servicing your customers and make a better experience. The one knock against a lot of these companies, though, if you still call a lot of them, you call like even a you know company like a Comcast. If they have to, the key is they have to actually now make these forums as part of the call because you know you call a company and you know maybe it's not their problem. What do they do? It's not our problem. But what they maybe should be doing is going. Yeah, it's not something I necessarily can help you with, but I see a great conversation on that exact topic over here. Let me send you a link to it. Yeah. And that's a powerful and much better customer experience that is with one easy change. What did they do? They typed search in the search bar of something about the problem and found something that worked to be a possible solution. It sounds like in all of this as well, though, that, that one of the things that you're saying is that in all these different things, there's there's people, process, and 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 systems, and it seems that the um, many companies have almost hidden their people behind their processes and systems or the technology and things. But actual fact, what you're saying is actually we need to get the people out in front. Uh, absolutely, it, it is about people, and you know, there's this story to that as well, which uh, you know certainly give to you and I talk about in the book. But even beyond you know about people, it's this. It's common sense. I think a lot of times, you know, companies got into a lot of legalese. They got into, oh, we can't, you know, here's our line of demarcation. We can't pass this because, you know, legal liability. I think some of that stuff is just sheer silliness. And I think partially it's societal. It's, you know, we've become very litigious. And, you know, we have to certainly look at those things and hopefully find solutions as a society. Yeah. Um, you know, because it's holding us back in a lot of ways, but it also requires someone to step out and just lead that. But to tell you about personal, I think where it hit home for me on a lot of this personal stuff was within social media. Um, when I was with Comcast and we were helping people out there and the Comcast Cares Initiative. So I, I Twittered out of this Comcast Cares. I started that in April 2008. Mm -hmm. And for the first six months or so, I was the one that was doing it. I was the one out there and I was out there seven days a week. I'd be out there usually at six in the morning till about two in the morning, almost every day. Blimey. Then one day I said, you know what guys, tomorrow I have to take the day off. I didn't get into why I didn't get into it. But tomorrow I'm gonna have to take the day off. Sorry, I won't be out here. And so you know the next day I went through the, the day is and you know at the end of the day I went through and looked at my normal search. And what I found were people were responding to people and they're saying, you know, let's let Comcast Cares have his day. You know, can I help you? Sure. You know, and it came down to the reasoning for that was 
they knew my knew who I was. They knew uh, a lot about me, and because of news accounts, not because uh, I had my Twitter handle uh, labeled that way. Mm-hmm. And they realized that that day was the anniversary of my daughter's death. Now that's not the day that I not the reason I took the day off, but they didn't know that. They they found this. They assumed this, and that's what they did. Social media is much more personal than people realize. And as I look at all these companies doing things in social media, they're missing it. They're missing that boat. You know, back in the day, you know, all the companies that were out there, and you know, when I started out there, there's probably about four or five of us. So there's not many companies that were in social media at the time. But what was interesting, I'll use Starbucks as an example. We knew the Starbucks handle was Brad Nelson. Yeah. You know, we knew who these people were. We knew every one of them. It was a much more personal interaction. And these companies saw, well, it's Starbucks. This is how they do it. So we're going to replicate what Starbucks did. What they didn't replicate was the fact that we knew it was Brad. Right. And, you know, we connected with Brad. And, you know, with what we did back then, a lot of the handles, you know, via Twitter at least, were also still included some personal stuff because we didn't get into like worrying about all kinds of different things that we <laughs> kind of worry about today. And, you know, we allowed it to kind of flow that way and it built this respect and built this trust. Trust comes from human to human. You know, people don't tend to trust brands. They trust individuals. And, you know, there's a power there. There's a, an ability there. For companies, you want to build trust, you have to do it through your individuals. You have to do it through the greatest assets that you have, which is your employees. And these are key key things that you can do. So that's something I would actually encourage companies to start to recognize and find ways to, to really get their employees to be involved in social media, find ways to teach them about it, teach them what they can do, what they shouldn't do, you know, what the power of it is. But also send a message to their own employees. We trust you. You know, yeah. oftentimes in business, our message to our own employees is we don't trust you. That's why we have policies and procedures. You can't do this because we don't trust you. You can't access. You know, my favorite is how we block social media sites, um, and this is done by virtually all companies, at least all big companies. That to me is really funny because I usually go into work. I usually have my iPhone, I usually have my iPad. Oftentimes I have my lap, my personal laptop with me. All you're doing is making it slightly harder for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Stopping me. For me, what the stuff I write about in the blog is, is I'm, I look at how, I'm really interested in how companies build better relationships with their both their customers and their people. And it's like that whole engagement thing, whether it's customer engagement or employee engagement. But it seems to me that what you're talking about is, uh, as well as, is, is, you know, empowering your people, training them, equipping them with the right, you know, the right sort of tools and almost like, and believing in them and sort of taking off the, the, the chains of control and saying, actually, you know what, it's okay to go out there and advocate on our behalf. Here's our values. Here's, here's what, here's our do's and sort of don'ts. Now go off and, and, and build relationships with people what it's all about and you know it's something that you know very few companies have done but it's it's really interesting cuz you're know, looking at social media you you know the companies that we tend to talk a lot about are companies like Coca-Cola where their their own customers are really doing a lot of the, the discussion yeah uh, we talk about Zappos Zappos gets talked all the time in fact you know, for a lot of people in social media it's become kind of a drinking game and well, why are they talked about well they're talked about the, they encourage all their employees to be in social media and have for years mm. and built a huge trust that's really built up a lot of their business and a lot of the discussion about them is because, you know, how much people, you know, I you know, always said six degrees of separation to someone, you know, connected to Zappos. You can easily find a way to, that you're connected to Zappos. Sure. And, you know, these are things that people missed as they, they were looking through what social media is about. Uh, they, they they too much think it's oh it's about the brand, I you know I'm I use social media you know do I use social media to go follow brands, no I use social media to connect to family and friends I use social media to search out topics and search out things that are important to me, 
I don't use it to go connect to, to brands. I really don't. And I don't know many people that do. Sure. You know, we, you know, we use Facebook to connect to those people that we know. We use Twitter to meet new people. We use LinkedIn to have those professional relationships. Yeah. In the book, you build, you, you build it up all this these stories and it's almost layer and layer. And in, in the end, you sort of pull it all together where you say, and you urge every business to create their, what you call their, their own relationship hub. hub. So can you explain to me what you mean by that and where I would get started if I wanted to build one for my business, let's say? Yeah, the, the first thing is really recognizing, you know, why we're there. You know, what are you striving to do? And then creating this environment where your own employees want to be part of it with your customers. They want to build your business and, you know, really get to know intimately your customers and, and where your customers then have a willingness to advocate for you and do so. And, you know, I tell the story in that chapter and it's really funny because I wasn't sure how it was going to fit it in, but of a small town, you know, supermarket chain. I think they, they, oh, they're just about to open their fourth location. I, I remember this story. Go on. Yeah, please. It's a, it's a small chain called McCaffrey's and, you know, McCaffrey's quite interesting. I've watched them for years and, you know, they're not the cheapest one out there, but people advocate for them all the time. People, you know, shop there, even though they're probably more of a premium price as opposed to a discount price. When people go there, it, it's kind of like that town center type thing where they go to meet <laughs> their people, uh, their friends and whatnot to, to have that shopping experience together. And what's really fascinating was a number of years ago, their main location had a fire and it, and it was down. And of course, that meant employees weren't going to have jobs and, and whatnot. And you know, people were actually, you know, their own customers were donating money for their employees to have insurance to actually, you know, continue to get by, so they would come back and work there when uh, the place was rebuilt. It's been rebuilt. It's now thriving. And as I said, they're about to open another location. But this type of feeling, I think that feeling is a very indicative of a lot of smaller companies. Yeah you know, where there is that connectedness, there's that connected to their customer. So the relationship hub is just creating this aura within your business that centers on that customer. And, you know, for smaller businesses, I think that will be easy. I think there's some larger businesses that have some good examples of that. Mm -hmm. Really thinking through everything you do to be about that customer experience and, you know, therefore building trust with that customer. You know, and I think the reason why McCaffrey's is such a great example is, you know, these customers are willing to pay a premium to go there because they want that service experience. They want that experience with those employees who they trust. Mm. You know, so they're willing to do that. And so these other companies that, oh, I want to raise rates all the time. And there's no trust in them. You know, there's ways you can do that. But first, you really need this that relationship piece. You need it to be so powerful that they want to connect to you. And I, I, one of the things I ask a lot of times with, within, you know, when I'm speaking and stuff and speaking to a lot of marketers, I ask, you know, the fact is, is your company share worthy? Is your company one where people would want to share on their own? Sure. I can think of very few businesses that really meet that. You know, very few businesses that I go, I want to talk about that. Sure. Um, so that, I mean, that feels like a, it may be a big change for many leaders, marketers, companies, et cetera. It, it, it is a big change, it, it, but it's, the problem that's really going on is we've done everything we can to get away from the customers. Some larger company CEOs, they're not talking directly to customers. They're sure. not having that dialogue. And, and we've actually even pushed our customers further away. We've outsourced you know, our customer service departments, we've, you know, oh, that's a cost center. I want nothing to do with them. Mm. We don't view our customer service departments as relationship centers. The reason why people would want to actually do business with us, it's a cost. Yeah. That to me is such a fundamental mistake. And, you know, it takes, you know, the service leaders, and I, in some ways I blame service leaders for not within their own organizations showing how important they are to the overall scheme of things. We have chief marketing officers. Why? Because marketers have done an incredible job of saying how important they are to the organization. Yeah. We have very few chief customer officers because our service departments have not been able to justify 
why they're there. We try to make service department sales centers. They're they're fun. You call up and they try and sell you, and they even you know, help you with you know your need reason for calling. Yes, it's so annoying, you know. But now, if fine, the service leaders haven't led that revolution. But what's going on today is customers are actually leading that revolution. They're basically saying, you know what? If you want me to be do your marketing, you need to deliver. You need to deliver on the experience, which goes well beyond the call center. It goes to the product piece. It goes to your web piece. It goes to every aspect where you, you know your customer touches. So I expect actually some dramatic shifts over the next two years. Um, we've already seen an increase in how brands were treated in the web. I think there's some great examples in the book. I talked about Netflix uh, and their whole fiasco last year with price increases. Sure. Verizon had a feed that they tried to introduce in the last week of the year, a typical slow news cycle, and the Internet went crazy over it. And eventually they had to rescind that. The Bank of America and their debit card fee, you know, all these things were blowing up on the Internet. We're watching this, this type of takeover activity by customers increasing. And we're actually seeing customers winning in almost every one of these scenarios. It's going to be imperative for companies to actually start to address these things because as customers have seen they can do this, they're going to do more and more and more. And Abs so Absolutely. I mean, there was a, an interesting and sort of topical uh, example of that was with NBC in the Olympic opening ceremony. That is correct. <laughs> which they tried to delay it by six hours to move it into a more more valuable advertising slot and mm -hmm. the customers just there was a couple of journalists and the customers just went ballistic mm -hmm. and um and they just had to just backpedal completely on that and i just thought it was it is funny it's it's it is a it's almost like a class action type thing via social media that is correct and you know what i'll say is and i think there's a lot of examples of mvc is you know a good example of that and i think businesses a have to have the trust but b they have to really determine what is important, uh, you know, what is important to them. NBC may make the decision, you know what, we paid, you know, what was it, $1.2 billion or whatever, one point eight. You know, I forget how much they paid for the Olympics, you know, we need to recoup this. And that, that may be part of it, but they, they need to have that dialogue. Sure. They need to have that dialogue to say, you know what, we need your help. You know what, I understand you want these things. We want to deliver these things. How can we come up with the best business use so you can get what you want but we can actually pay these costs. Sure. And that's the challenge too, is how do you have that dialogue? And I'm, I'll be curious to see, but at the same time, what's also interesting about the Olympics is th that same conversation has been happening during every Olympics since the late nineties. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So it still comes down to, are you having that right dialogue? You know, what is that right dialogue? And at the end of the day, you may still make a business decision that says, you know what, we do need to make the ad revenue, and this is how we make ad revenue. Yeah. But you're going to need to talk through that. You're going to need to, hey, say, here's the deal. Here's precisely why. I mean, yeah. is, is, is this sort of, this, you talked about paradigm shift. I mean, in your experience, if, uh, say, a CEO was listening to this or a senior leader in a business had listened to this and thought, right, I see that coming. I can feel that in my, in my, my business and in my, in my industry. Where should I start? What's the, what's the first thing that I should do? Where, where, what would you suggest that they, they, they do? What, what, what should, they, should they be looking at? What should they be starting to do? Uh, you know, it's funny. There's two things that, that I would say to that. Depending on the size of the organization, they, they certainly may want to uh, bring in someone to be a chief customer officer and focus on these things. But if not, one of the things, you know, the easy things to do, you know, we talked about in social media, listen first. Yeah. And I'm very big into listening, but I don't think mo most companies listen very well. In fact, I, I would say most companies are failure at listening because they're really looking at things from a PR perspective. Sure. Uh, you know, what's going to blow up? Oh, that's not going to blow up. I'm not going to do that. And the other reason it's a failure is companies are listening in social media, but they're not listening through all their different channels. You know, it really requires listening in a very authentic way to the customer's calling, the emails you're receiving, the surveys you're receiving, all this information, and, and certainly starting to dig into it. The problem is service departments historically, you know, what do they share? They, they share calls that are good calls. Yeah, share the reality. So in many ways, 
CEOs actually don't really know what's happening. They think they do because they're getting shared certain things. Yeah. They need to get in with it. They need to get to the nitty gritty. You know, one of the things I, you know, one of, when I used to evaluate call centers, one of the things I used to always do was try to hang out in like the lunchroom or break area or different places where the, the representatives were hanging out. Why? Because I could listen into precisely what they're talking about. I could be a part of that conversation. And if you build trust with them, they'll tell you the world. They'll tell you precisely what's wrong with your company. They'll tell you different ways that you can fix it. They'll tell you why you're getting all the calls you're getting that are costing you money and ways you can fix all these things. You have to listen to it. So sometimes it does start with some of those lowest level employees. Listen at all levels. Let them know that you can you can build a new culture, and a new culture starts with the CEO recognizing the need for it. Sure, but it it also starts with the CEO getting to that lowest level, and then the two of them working together to really change throughout the organization. So you basically have got to go. You've got to be the CEOs effectively have got to be go, willing to go looking for the truth, however ugly it may or may not be. Yep, and then you know don't add to the problems in a lot of companies, which is one of the first things they do, we tend to go beat people up. And I think that that's been a problem. Yeah. It adds this cultural issue where people are scared for their jobs and, and a number of other things. I think what they have to do is, you know, work to change it, mm-hmm. work towards, you know, building that a newer culture that, that is about this openness and willing to share and getting everybody on that same page, which I think will be a lot of fun to watch. But it still comes down to culture because I watch a lot of companies, they say, oh, we need to implement these new so- internal social tools. You know, so people, so I can talk directly to the frontline employees and find out what they're talking about. And they put in these tools and then nothing happens. Sure. Well, nothing happens because they don't have the culture that goes along with it. They've been traditionally top down. So if you're traditionally top down, is someone going to be willing to share upward? Probably not because someone's going to beat them up in the process. So we need to need to lose our addiction to sort of process and technology and get and still get people out in front and get the right culture in place before any of this is going to generate any momentum. That is correct. So that, you know, if you want to really build that right business model, the other thing to remember though is you have, now have the millennial generation. They, they they thrive on on a lot of this stuff. Sure. They thrive on the connectedness. They you know a lot of people get frustrated by them because they they're told to do something. And they they ask a lot of questions. In fact, I love love when people refer to them as Generation Y, W-H-Y, because they like to ask why. They like to know, you know, why are we doing that? And people see it as them being more troublemakers. Well, it's not that they're being troublemakers. They want to understand. Mm. And they, you know, they want to, you know, get everyone's perspective. They want their boss's perspective, but they also want their peers' perspective. You know, see, so these are things to also remember because there's a difference and a change there. You really need to recognize that and you know, know it is important to them and find ways that you can deliver on that because many of companies want to be the employer of choice, not just for the older generation, but the younger generation. They really want people to want to come to work. Sure, they've got to attract the talent and, then, and, and talent, can, talent sniffs out good culture every mm-hmm. time. So Frank, in, in the interest of uh, time, I sort of slightly run over, so I apologize for that. <laughs> is there anything else you'd like to add, so top tips for our you know, readers and listeners, this is my sort of penultimate question. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's listen, 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 listen. And, you know, when I talk about that, you know, listening, you know, I, I'm going to give an example that we've seen in social media, you know, recently. There's a, you know, a situation where this woman, Catherine Sloan, did a piece about, oh, all social media managers should be under 25. And, you know, what happens, you know, a lot of social media managers, we went ballistic over it, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. And I watched this dialogue and two things I noticed was a, how personal and vindictive in some cases it was. And I thought that was horrifying. So I'm trying to actually create a movement to be much more positive in social media. Yeah. But beyond that, what I really took from it though, is, you know, we go around preaching, listening, but people weren't listening. You know, if you actually paid attention to not just her words, but you start reading all the other things she was talking about, she's done numerous articles. And the articles were all centered on, I'm in this younger generation. I just graduated from college. We can't get jobs. 
Yeah. You know, that's something we should be talking about. My view is she, you know, struggling to get jobs, and she basically said, "Oh my God, you know, we do all these things, and we've been doing all this social stuff for years. Yeah. We should be able to get be social media managers because you know we should at least be qualified for that. Come on." <laughs> And that may not, she might not have a deep understanding of certain things. I mean, you could certainly have that dialogue with her. But understand, I think that the conversation of we need to find jobs and we need help getting there, that's a good conversation. Absolutely. We should have been listening to her better to have that conversation. And she could help create that conversation. And we could have, too, if we were listening right. And I think it's a great example of, you know, how we listen and maybe we listen to what we want to hear and not necessarily listen as deep as we can. And I think if you learn from that, you can be do things that are extraordinarily powerful. Fantastic. I uh, couldn't agree more. And so for my final question, which is a question I always end these interviews on, the question is, is there anything that you would like to shamelessly plug? <laughs> well, you know, really my biggest thing besides at your service, which I'd certainly love for people to to check out and decide if it's for them. I think it's, a, it's something interesting. I don't think it's your normal uh, book that's out there. But the biggest thing I'm trying to do is really just promote being positively social and being, you know, start, you know, we as leaders in social media, we can help change the dialogue. Lately, I've been seeing a lot of negative conversation. In fact, not really dialogue. It's been basically, here's my view, and you better believe it if you're not, you're an idiot. <laughs> We have to stop that. And, you know, we as social media leaders need to help guide that. We have to guide that by changing how we sometimes do things. We have to guide it by, you know, encouraging conversations. We refer to social media as the cocktail party. But at a cocktail party, you wouldn't have conversations like, you know, if you don't like that, you're an idiot. Because someone would be like, shut up. But it, <laughs> you know, we have to really do things a little differently. And I think we can help lead that. Uh, you know, in mid-August, you know, we're gonna, I'm going to try and have a day where it's about positively social, more information on my blog on that. But I'm actually hoping to do uh, things much broader than that. And, you know, so you know, visit my blog. You'll, there'll be more on that, frankliason.com. But, it, you know, to me, it's going to be an ongoing conversation, not just about one day. Frank, that's fantastic. And do let me know about that because I'd be more than happy and glad and, and, and really keen to, to help out wherever I can. Well, I appreciate that. Right, well, thank you for your time. Well, thank you, and have a great day. You too.